from the heart of rural France. This is the Keto Woman podcast, brought to you by me. Welcome to episode number 132, where I'm joined by Dr. Paul Mason. Paul is a sports doctor who also holds degrees in physiotherapy and occupational health. He is internationally recognized in the field of low-carb nutrition and utilizes it in the management of his patients, including elite athletes. He has authored a chapter on nutrition in an internationally recognized sports medicine textbook and regularly lectures both nationally and internationally. Dr. Mason also provides online nutritional consultations via video conference, which can be accessed through his Twitter handle, at Dr. Paul Mason. Paul asked me to mention that he does teleconsults, which I'm sure some of you will be happy to hear. It's not always easy, is it, finding a doctor who is on board with keto or low carb? And these days, it's so easy to connect online. I used to see a counsellor online via Zoom and it worked really well. I'm sure there are issues with prescribing and so on depending where you are, but it could be the perfect place to start if you are struggling to get the help you need locally. I could have gone on for hours chatting to Paul, but at some point I have to let my guests get back to their busy lives. He has kindly agreed though to come back another time, so watch this space. Before we get started with the interview, I have something else to tell you that I'm super excited about. Terry Lance and I are starting a new weekly podcast called Monday Mindset, which will be beaming its way to you across the web waves on a, you've guessed it, Monday, (laughs) very soon. I'll tell you more about it next week when it should be ready to launch. Back now to Dr. Paul Mason. I hope you find our chat as fascinating as I did. Welcome, Paul, to the Keto Woman podcast. How are you doing today? I'm fantastic, thanks. It's very good to meet you across the web waves. Look, it's uh, been a long time coming. It has indeed. And I recognize your setup from the video of yours I was watching on YouTube the other day. (laughs) Yeah, I don't have much originality here. I'm sort of always in the same (laughs) seat, same microphone. Same here, actually, usually in the same spot in my, uh, well, not not too messy bedroom today, but <laughs> dogs to one side that hopefully aren't going to start barking. <laughs> no, well, that's uh, well, that's why I'm sort of always in the same corner, you know, acoustic isolation. Perfect. <laughs> well, perhaps you could just set the scene a little bit. Tell us a bit about you. Well, I'm a sports doctor. I'm in from Sydney in Australia, and I've been practicing low carbohydrate and metabolic medicine for several years now and I guess I I came into the low-carb field a little bit by chance. I happened to read an editorial in the British Journal of Sports Medicine that was authored by none other than Timothy Noakes and Peter Bruckner, Mm -hmm. two doyens in the world of sports medicine. And I have to admit on first pass I was quite sceptical but because I have the utmost respect for the scientific integrity of these two chaps, I actually went back to it and I had a look at all the references and I found that, hey, it actually was incredibly well referenced and the points they were making about the benefits of low-carbohydrate diets and by definition high-fat diets in the management of conditions like diabetes, it was fundamentally solid. And I guess this was also about the time there was that uh, famous video getting around by Robert Lustig, uh, Sugar, the Bitter Truth, and that ended up having several million views on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I guess I sort of just embraced the concept for me personally. uh, You know, I was watching my diet meticulously and exercising a lot as per the current dietary guidelines. I was in my 30s and I wasn't, you know, hitting it out of the ballpark in terms of my own personal metabolic health. So there was certainly some room for myself to have gains there but it was very interesting too when just taking the low-lying fruit I remember I was in a clinic one day and a mother came in with her children and the children were sitting there with these 600 ml bottles of soft drink and I made a comment that may or may not have been well received Uh, you know I didn't know how it was going to be received along the lines of kids have no reason to be putting that much sugar into their body. And the reaction of the mother, I think, really solidified it. She was just grateful. Mm. She'd always, it seemed to have this nagging thought in the back of their head that, you know, the sugar, sure it was low fat and all that, but surely it can't have been that good for her kids. And what I essentially did was to validate her concerns that nobody else had voiced 
and gave her permission to act on it. And right there and then she looked at her kids and said, right, you are not having any more soft drink. And I don't think they processed what that meant, but that actually meant no more soft drink. I'm not buying it full stop from here on in. I mean, I, ho- I hope they enjoyed their last few sips and they literally got thrown <laughs> in the waste bin on the way out. Brilliant. That was, I guess, you know, the low-lying fruit because we can all say, well, clearly soft drink is bad for you. And then, you know, that message, I guess, has solidified over the years and we say the same about fruit juice now. It's very well understood now. Back then, fruit juice was considered by all and sundry to be, you know, a nutritious, healthy healthy, refreshing beverage, and now we say... Well, that took a long time, didn't it? And it's still... Well, true. You know, it's still a bit pervasive, isn't it? Well, it's fruit, so it, it can't be that bad. Well, that's true. I mean, it's got this aura of being all natural, so it can't be bad, despite mm. the fact that it's basically Frankenstein as far as you know, what fruits <laughs> yeah. used to look like and what they look like now. But, yeah, so now it's, um, you know, basically the message that I communicate has sort of solidified over time and it's no soft drink and then it's no fruit juice and then we say well you know well what about these complex carbs that you think are healthy the sweet potato and the brown rice you know you know that's just you know a chain of glucose molecules and which is essentially sugar and it's very interesting if I reflect on the uh, you know last 10 years or so of the advice that I've given to my patients it's been a a pretty constant um, change it certainly hasn't been something that I've, uh, from day dot, I've been advocating strongly for a ketogenic diet, but I certainly have been looking at the research, or certainly for the last several years I have, um, but it did take me a while to get there. And there's certainly things that I was much more supportive of, both professionally and personally initially. For instance, I used to probably have somewhat of an addiction to artificial sweeteners. I didn't really see the problem with them, but funnily enough, nor had I looked at the literature in any great depth to um, come to my conclusion that there wasn't a great problem. And I think this is actually shared by a lot of doctors. A lot of when uh, you often hear the refrain from doctors, oh, well, there's, there's no evidence for that. I think what they really mean to say is, well, I haven't actually looked at the evidence for that and mm-hmm. I'm not aware of the evidence. The term there's no evidence for that usually means I don't know the evidence for that. It doesn't actually mean it's not there. I'd be very interested to hear a little bit more about what you think about artificial sweeteners. I'm sure, well, I'm not sure, but maybe there's a difference between the types that there are out there. I'd be interested to hear what you think about that. Well, I mean, first of all, they're not benign and we can have a look at it. Certainly the animal studies, and I I understand that we're not mice, but if there's something that causes deleterious effects in mice, then I would certainly say, you know, that would should give us caution for us ingesting it as well. We're, we're both animals. And that can be from a metabolic perspective. That can even be from, uh, you know, there are some people who are worried that there's animal studies demonstrating the potential link to malignancies or cancers. But even if you put those uh, concerns to one side, we certainly have gastrointestinal side effects. So one of the most common classes of artificial sweeteners is what we call the sugar alcohols, which are known as polyols. And the way these work is essentially they trigger the the taste receptors on our tongue, the sweet taste receptors, but they can't be digested or absorbed by our body. So that's why they're they're considered non-caloric or, or very, very low calories. But they can be fermented by the bacteria in our guts within what we call the microbiome or, back, you know, whatever term you want to use for it. And when these bacteria ferment it, they produce gas, which means we feel bloated. And they actually have what we call an osmotic effect where they draw fluid in, which can also contribute to diarrhea. And this is why when you look at a, a packet of diabetic lollies or chewing gum that's artificially sweetened it'll usually have in very fine print Mm -hmm. usually too small for the diabetic eyes to see (laughs) warning excess consumption may have a laxative effect and that is absolutely true so excess consumption of these artificial sweeteners will certainly cause gastrointestinal upset in a lot of people and it is a threshold level if you have a tiny amount it's probably not going to be noticeable but once you pass that threshold and for a lot of people, that threshold is a lot lower than they realise, they will certainly have those effects. The trouble is they might not attribute it to some, you know, sweetened sweets or something like that, and they'll probably end 
blaming something else. And some people seem to be super sensitive and sometimes there's a difference between different types. Oh, like they're absolutely one person will say they're fine with erythritol, but allulose just they can't even have a few grains and, you know, so it does seem to depend, doesn't it? Well, some people certainly have different thresholds. So one of the diagnostic tools for that they used to use for irritable bowel disease was to basically see how much gas you could actually insufflate into your intestines before you felt discomfort. Because, I mean, the whole volume of the gastrointestinal tract is only about a litre, so it only takes a very modest amount of gas in any one portion of it before you start feeling uncomfortable. So we've got this side effect of artificial sweeteners, but more importantly, we have something called the mesolimbic pathway. And the mesolimbic pathway is what drives binge eating behaviour. It's what drives overeating. And this is particularly important. Any behaviour we do, any addictive behaviour, if you were to snort a line of cocaine or if you were to have a gambling addiction or what have you, you have these issues because your brain releases dopamine within this mesolimbic circuit and that dopamine is inherently rewarding and reinforcing of that behaviour. And artificial sweeteners, because they stimulate the sweet sensation that leads to a release of this dopamine so if you're having issues with sweet cravings and things like that then having regular consumption of artificial sweeteners is only going to exacerbate that drive and unfortunately sometimes you just have to go cold turkey to break the cycle but it isn't quite that simple and Probably this is a reasonable time to introduce another concept that is a, a little bit tangential, but I think incredibly important and very misunderstood in the field of nutrition, and that's iron deficiency. Because our bodies need iron to make these neurotransmitters in our brain, the neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine that actually allow us to feel happy. And when we don't have enough iron, we basically end up with a deficiency of these neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be living in a dark cloud. We're not going to be feeling very happy. And we know that there is a reliable way to actually trigger the release of the last vestiges of dopamine in our brain that can, you know, potentially lift that black cloud, even if it's only transiently. And that's eating sweet foods. And this is why, so the, this is the connection between people who are low in iron and who often have binge eating issues. Wow, that's so interesting. <laughs> and you can do as much cognitive behavioural therapy as you want. That's not going to help you worth one lick if you're iron deficient. But here's the thing. So iron deficiency is very common in females. We know a, a large proportion of females will have actually menstrual blood losses in excess of what their body is able to replenish in terms of iron because there's iron contained in blood. Every time you have a pregnancy, um, the whole process of uh, the pregnancy and the labour leads to a significant loss of iron. And then females tend to have listened to public health messaging more than males, which means they askew red meat and these other heme iron containing foods from their diet. So we really have this absolute epidemic of iron deficiency. Mm. And then to add insult to injury, we have something called a functional iron deficiency, which very few doctors understand. And the way you can think about a functional iron deficiency is that you have lots of iron in the body, but your body can't use it. And this is actually an evolved state. So we've actually evolved because pathogens, germs, can't survive, as a rule, in our body without also accessing iron. So for our immune system to try and eradicate an infection when we're infected, it will actually lock iron away in something called a ferritin store. So our stores of iron will increase, which is called ferritin, but the bacteria, the pathogens won't be able to access it, but nor will we. But in a normal state, when we have transient infections, you maybe get infected and then a week later you're actually, you know, back on an even keel, then, you know, you'll, you'll be able to access that iron and start to remake those neurotransmitters. And it's well known that depression is associated with infection. We know this. This is it's considered something in medicine that we, we know we know that it happens, but 
it's generally considered that we don't know why. Well, that's actually the mechanism. It's this functional sequestration of things like iron, which are necessary for synthesis of the neurotransmitters. But now in modern society, we have a problem because with our metabolic ill health and our diets that are triggering autoimmune disease, we don't just get inflamed for a week. We actually have chronic inflammation for months and months and years on end. And the response of our body to this is to assume that we're have an infection because the body hasn't evolved with these other conditions. It's only evolved to know what to do with infections. So it mistakes any state of inflammation, whether it's autoimmune or metabolically derived, as an infectious one and it locks away the iron. So we end up with people who have this long-term state of functional iron sequestration that's being locked away in the ferritin stores. The average doctor will do a blood test and say, you've got heaps of iron in your body, it's absolutely fine because you've got high ferritin levels and they won't have any understanding that your body can't access that iron. The problem is inflammation. And unless you find an effective way to resolve that inflammation, you're going to continue to be relatively or functionally iron deficient. You're going to continue to be relatively depressed and anxious because you're lacking these neurotransmitters and you're going to have these urges to binge eat simply because you're living in a dark cloud and it makes sense that you would want, you know, it's only natural that you'd want to lift that black cloud once in a while and binge eating is a reliable way to do that. And I've lost count of the number of patients I've had who have either had absolute iron deficiency or functional iron deficiency that once we've corrected that problem, their cravings and their binge eating issues resolved. There was no cognitive behavioural therapy. There was no spending time on a shrink's couch or anything at all like that. It was just correcting the physiology. Wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> and I know it's, it's an automatic thing to start thinking of yourself when somebody starts talking about things that just resonate and there are so many things there that I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> yes. Are there a way you can tell with blood tests if this is a problem for you? I, I've always been told that you need to have a good level of ferritin. Ferritin tells you how much is storing and that's a good thing. Is there any way by looking oh, yeah. at the blood test yeah, you can tell what the is. situation is? The problem with iron studies is that they're often misinterpreted. So all that ferritin will tell you is that you are storing iron in the body. But it won't tell you whether that iron is available for the body. So if you have a very low level of ferritin, it will tell you absolutely that you're iron deficient. Right. But if you have a normal or a high level of ferritin, and in actual fact I would argue the higher the level of ferritin, that suggests that you have a functional iron deficiency because it normally shouldn't be that high. Mm -hmm. So if you have a low level of ferritin, that can be useful clinically. If it's high or normal, then that's less discriminatory. So we, we say that it's a sensitive test for iron deficiency. But just because you've got a normal level doesn't prove you have enough. Then we need to go to some things called inflammatory markers. Uh, the fancy name for them is acute phase reactants, which basically mean they go up in states of inflammation. And there's several of these. Um, the two most common ones we talk about are C-reactive protein. Uh, usually abbreviated as CRP or ESR, which stands for erythrocyte sedimentation rate. But again, the interpretation of these is absolutely critical. The reason being that there's different sensitivities of CRP that we can do. And the normal, uh, very normal cutoff is five. And unfortunately, you might be four or three, which is, you know, will be under their threshold for the standard test, but that is still inflamed. I believe you probably have to get down to less than 0 0.5 or 0 0.4 to actually be considered to be in a what would be an optimally healthy range. Without understanding the element of inflammation, if you don't look at concurrent inflammation when you're looking at somebody's iron levels, it's going to be basically a, a waste test. It's going to be impossible to correctly interpret. This is a big problem that we actually have with our blood tests that we usually have these reference ranges which are set based on population data. So when you get this page of blood tests and the doctor scrans it and he tells you in three seconds everything is fine, he's not looking at every value or she. Mm -hmm. What they're looking at 
is they're looking at to see if there's an asterisk or a bolding that tells them it falls outside this reference range. And these reference ranges don't reflect optimal health. If you walk out the front door, 19 in every 20 people is not optimally healthy. There's more than one sick person in every 20 people in the population. And yet that's the level at which we set these reference ranges for. It's well known too that some of the reference ranges, as the population gets sicker, the goalposts just move. We see this with liver enzymes, we see it with several other things. So what would have been considered to be quite unhealthy in the 1950s the goalpost are now moved, so we say that's just normal. No, it's not normal. It just means that we're unhealthy. It means we're accepting of being unhealthy. And if you have this better understanding and you can say, well, look, I want to do a more sensitive CRP test. I want to have a look at, you know, really what's going on with my iron stores and the other inflammatory markers. That could offer a lot of benefit. For example, just on iron, If you're functionally iron deficient, we find a trigger for inflammation, we get rid of that. If you're absolutely iron deficient, we can give you an iron infusion. And did you know there's actually been some research where we've actually females who have been iron deficient have been had their waist circumference measured, had their body fat analysed, their body composition, they've been given an iron infusion and then sent away. They've been given no dietary advice, no instruction on exercise. And do you know what happens? they lose weight, their waist circumference goes down, their lean muscle goes up Mm. and their fat tissue dissolves. Why? Because not only is iron essential for producing these chemicals in the brain, it's also essential for some of the the energy-producing pathways in our cells. The iron is actually necessary for our body to burn energy. So you can't effectively burn fat as energy if you're deficient in iron. This is just incredibly important. Mm. Gosh, there's a lot to think about there. So how do we fix it? I mean, for example, well, I haven't had a test for a while, but every time I have for the last, as long as I can remember, I am chronically low in iron, you know, just really across the board to the extent that I've been classified as anemic, had to have an infusion once before I could have an operation. And I don't seem to be able to get those levels up with supplementation. My keto diet isn't perfect. I have ups and downs, but overall, you know, I'm keto. So that inflammation should be improved. And I I should see presumably those iron levels going up again. Well, one of the problems is that if you're inflamed, that can, and especially if you have intestinal inflammation, that can impair your absorption of iron. So we know I always screen my patients who come in low in iron and usually what's happened is I'm not the first person to diagnose somebody who's low in iron, but I always ask the question, I say, why are you low in iron? And nine times out of ten, the patient will look at me and say, I don't know why. And for me that's unacceptable medicine because it's one thing to diagnose a problem, but how on God's green earth can you fix it if you don't know what the problem is? And I say, well, I'm a simple guy. We we think about this simply. So you either don't put enough iron into your body, which means you're not eating enough heme iron, you avoid red meat or, you know, you're only eating fish or chicken or you're a vegetarian or what have you, or you're eating heme iron, but you're not absorbing it. There might be intestinal inflammation. We have to check. Do you have celiac disease? We can actually do a very sensitive test for intestinal inflammation called a fecal calprotectin, and I think that should be almost a standard test in anybody with iron deficiency. And the other option is that you are ingesting it and you are absorbing it, but you're just losing excessive amounts, and this is commonly seen in females. So if it's a male who's over the age of 65, I'll be wondering Is there potentially a bowel cancer? Do we need to do a colonoscopy, look for hidden blood losses coming from the back passage? If it's a female, I'll ask about menstruation. Mm -hmm. And there's medications that we can actually give to actually reduce the uh, amount of menstrual blood loss. And it gets a little bit trickier because a lot of females will talk about hormonal therapies. The simple fact is that a lot of the hormonal therapies will actually worsen insulin resistance and will be associated with weight gain as well. So I tend to actually prefer non-hormonal medication. There's one called tranexamic acid, which is quite safe and very effective, and you only take it for the days of your menstruation. 
and um, that leads to a, a re reasonably significant reduction in volume of blood loss and therefore reduction in loss of iron. But you really sort of have to go through that diagnostic sieve to work out why somebody is low in iron. And if you're one of these people who has this intestinal inflammation, and that's commonly one that's never thought of or never investigated for properly, then it makes sense that taking oral supplementation wouldn't confer any benefit because if you're not absorbing it from a piece of steak, why would you absorb it from a tablet? Mm. And to boot, the tablets usually have side effects as well. They usually cause constipation. They, you know, they cause your stools to go black and yeah, um, a lot of people yeah, um, make you feel sick. don't tolerate. Mm. Uh, certainly a lot of people don't tolerate that. So I certainly, uh, I don't consider oral supplementation of iron to be a preferred solution unless somebody perhaps is a vegan and they openly admit that they're not going to uh, ingest any heme iron dietary-wise. And I certainly think that, uh, you know, that in that case it could well be indicated. But my preference is for people to have easily adjusted biologically available iron in the source of red meat and understand that the pigment in meat, it's not blood, it's something called myoglobin. It's a protein found in meat. And that myoglobin is what gives meat its colour. So as a rule of thumb, the deeper the colour of the meat, the more iron it has. And that's why chicken and fish are really not great for this. Yeah. More red meat. We keep being told by the media and all sorts that is killing the planet. I saw a good meme the other day that was talking about the environmental impact of the lockdown globally mm. and how things are starting to improve a little bit environmentally and it said but there's no difference in the number of cows <laughs> yeah i mean certainly that's uh, we're constantly being admonished that you know we we should reduce our red meat um, consumption um, for the sake of the environment but that really doesn't stack up when you put it to any degree of scientific scrutiny for several reasons what a lot of people don't realise is that if you have pasture-raised meat, that can actually be carbon negative. So if we have a, let's take a, a grazing ruminant animal. So what actually happens is um, it eats grass. Some of the root system from the grass will die and that will then um, form part of the biomass of the soil actually replenishing the thickness of the soil and actually acting as a form of carbon sequestration. The manure from the cow will actually also form part of the topsoil. The water that the cow drinks is actually not lost water. That actually just passes through the cow and is then used to uh, irrigate the fields. So what we actually end up with is replenishment of soil, which actually acts as a carbon sink. And what a lot of people don't realise is that monocrop agriculture actually destroys topsoil. Mm. And by 2050 or thereabouts, we'll probably have burnt through more than 50% of the topsoil that we will ever have had. And the significance of that cannot be underestimated because that basically means that we're on the way to permanent starvation without topsoil. Without soil, nothing grows. And the problem is monocrop agriculture actually depletes our topsoil. Every time you take a till to soil, you expose these trillions of microbes to ultraviolet radiation and you expose them to the wind that can blow it blow it away. And so what we actually see is we see a thinning of this layer of topsoil and uh, when that's completely depleted, uh, we are effectively uh, going to be faced with lack of food production and essentially starvation on a mass scale. And this is obviously uh, politically unpalatable to talk about. And I think it's uh, the reality is so scary that we're not hearing any discussion from this from uh, public government officials or anything at all like that. The simple truth is, though, that with ruminant agriculture, this is the only way that we can reliably restore topsoil. And people on vegan and vegetarian diets who uh, believe that they can actually exist without consuming any animal products, this is just fanciful. So, I mean, the very concept of um, we, we talk about fertilisers from fossil fuel fertilisers and things like that, well, think about what exactly fossil fuels are. So fossil fuels actually... Uh, the remnants of the dinosaurs, of living beings. That's what they actually are. It's part of the carbon cycle. It's like in the Lion King, you know, the circle of life. Mm -hmm. And not to get too deep about it all, but without death, there is no life. We actually need the biological matter that actually comes from essentially living creatures before us for us to actually be able to grow and thrive. 
And if you have soil, if you grow food in that soil and you do not replenish the nutrients with fertilizer, which requires animal byproduct, that soil will eventually become barren and it will not grow anything at all. The whole concept, the idea that you can grow something without the use of animal products indefinitely in soil is just fanciful. And I think if more people understood the science, I think we would well, certainly you wouldn't be able to make the argument about being an ethical vegetarian because we know that the monocrop agriculture leads to, you know, many more deaths and, you know, through caught up in combined harvesters and things like this. Now, this does not for a second excuse some of the reprehensible animal husbandry practices that we have around the world. Yes, that's what I was going to ask you about, actually, because it's very easy and unbalanced to compare pasture-raised cattle with large-scale monoculture growing of plants. It's somewhere in the middle that it gets a lot more sticky, isn't it? Well, one of the problems is that, you know, uh, because of the grain subsidies, which are basically from uh, political expedience in some countries, um, it actually becomes economically viable to actually feed grains to animals to fatten them up and things like this. But in a lot of places around the world, you actually do have true pasture-raised animals. So New Zealand and Australia, for instance, um, there is a, a, a degree of grain feeding for very short periods of time, but there's a lot of animals that spend their entire life pastured. And the ones that are grain fed, it's usually only for fairly short periods of time. But I certainly think it makes no sense if you're going to be growing crops which destroy the environment and then to feed them to animals. The unfortunate reality is that we probably have exceeded the capacity of what the earth can actually sustain in terms of food production or at least sustainable food production. At the moment, we're effectively in what we call drawdown to produce enough food to feed our population at the moment. It's impossible for us to do that without drawing upon these relatively limited resources like topsoil, mm -hmm. like fossil fuel fertilisers and things like this. And I don't have the answers for that, um, but I do feel very comfortable in my choice that eating pasture-raised animals that are ethically raised is actually beneficial for the environment and certainly not hurting the environment. Mm. Well, I know Peter Ballastet often talks about the importance of focusing on your own health and making yourself healthy the best way you can and with eating well and eating meat as part of that. And I was just thinking earlier with this whole balance, the fact is if you get yourself into a healthier place, you stop that, some at least of that ripple effect of all the things you need downstream that take up resources, all the medications, the time in hospital, the time at doctors, all those things that you don't actually think about the impact that that will have on the environment, as opposed to if you just eaten a bit more red meat, for example, in the first place. Well, that's true. And I think that's also an ethical consideration as well. I mean, we, we talk about animal welfare and quite rightly too, mm. but I think what's missing from the conversation sometimes is human welfare. We should be disgusted at unnecessary animal suffering, but so too should we be disgusted when we see preventable human suffering, people with diabetes having their limbs amputated with unhealing ulcers, being forced to go on dialysis where they're plugged into a machine for hours a day um, just to try and uh, stabilise their electrolytes because their kidneys are clapped out. People who have had heart attacks who can't walk up a flight of stairs. People who have had a stroke who they, they can't eat unassisted, half their body's paralysed and they're ending up living in nursing homes in deplorable quality of life, you know, incontinent wearing nappies. So this is, for the most part, preventable i believe every condition that i just mentioned there is significantly prevented with appropriate dietary management and in my opinion the diets that best protect against those are diets that are rich in animal foods so i think sometimes we need to have the conversation about human suffering and sometimes it's not even as overt as that it could be just what you alluded to before you said that 
uh, my discussion on iron deficiency resonated with you because, as you know, if you're iron deficient and you're low in neurotransmitters, while it might not have physical outward signs of how it's affecting you emotionally, it is incredibly tough. I see patients all the time and they, the mental, mental effects of malnourishment are every bit as bad for people as are the physical effects. So let's broaden the conversation. It's not to disregard anybody's point of view, but it's to make sure that we're looking at things in, they are complex issues and we look at them in their entirety. Absolutely. It's a fascinating subject. So we've been talking about improving your health, talking about how inflammation can damage it. And it seems a really appropriate time to talk about the importance of all that at the moment and the implication that COVID-19 is, is having on large groups of people, the associated disorders that are making the people who do contract this virus significantly worse off than people who are metabolically much healthier. Yeah, well, we know that some people quite, you know, will just have a sore throat and that's it mm. after getting coronavirus. Some people won't even know they've had the disease. So about 85% of people, if they have the illness, it'll be quite mild or non-existent. When I say quite mild, I mean, it, it won't be life-threatening. You won't end up in hospital. You still might feel pretty lousy, um, you know, and it could be like the worst flu you've ever had. But 15% of people will require more advanced medical care and a proportion of those, probably about a third of that 15%, could very well end up requiring intensive care. So my question is, what sets these people apart who might not even know they've had it to these people who could very well end up on death's door? And when I say that people might need ICU care, don't for a second think that that means once you walk into ICU that you're safe. So there's all this business about ventilators and all of that, how we need to make sure there's enough ventilators, otherwise, you know, people will die unnecessarily. Did you know, though, that even if you were to get a ventilator, if you have a, a bout of coronavirus that's severe, you've still only got a 4 in 10 chance of walking out of hospital alive. Getting a ventilator is no guarantee of survival. No. So It's not good for your health in the first place, is it? Being on a ventilator creates all sorts of problems. We can talk more about that. I mean, that's an incredibly long discussion. I think how people are managed nutritionally in hospital when they're on ventilators is abhorrent. But the point is, when we actually have a look at what sets these people apart, so the most common thing is saying, well, old people seem to, to have this. But when you actually look at the data a little bit closely, it's like, well, what is it about old people? Because we know we have sick old people, we know we have healthy old people. And it's factors like obesity and diabetes and high blood pressure that appear to be conferring these risks to the elderly. When we have a look at a study from the States, they actually measured the metabolic health of the adult population based on five metrics which are commonly used, you know, things like blood sugar levels and cholesterol levels, uh, things that are commonly used to assess metabolic health. And only 12% of the adult population in America was healthy across all five metrics, 12% that's really in good health. I mean, that's pretty appalling. But do you know what the number reduced to in the over 60s? 2%. Wow. So what we're looking at is a, uh, we've got a coronavirus pandemic right on a, uh, an epidemic of metabolic ill health. And all of these conditions, the obesity, the heart disease, the diabetes, the high blood pressure, it's got a common root cause. And that common root cause is insulin resistant. And the insulin resistance can be driven by a crap diet, basically a high carbohydrate, high vegetable oil, polyunsaturated oil diet. They're two, the two strongest drivers that I know of, of insulin resistance. And in actual fact, we've now got very good evidence that we can reverse diabetes with dietary management alone, cut out the vegetable oils, cut out the carbohydrates. And, you know, for all intents and purposes, we see very, very good results. And we know that if, if you are diabetic, if you have unstable blood sugar levels, and when these sugars bind to proteins on different cells in your in your blood they can bind to parts of your immune system things called natural killer cells which is the first line of defense against viruses it'll defunction them that'll increase your risk of infection but you don't even have to have unstable blood sugars to be having an impaired immune system so you can have what we call insulin resistance even before your blood sugar levels go up and there was a paper in nature just last year and that actually looked at 
a group of people who were insulin resistant and compare them to people who were actually ostensibly healthy and understand that these insulin resistant people had normal blood sugar levels. And they looked at what happened when they got viral respiratory tract infections. And what they actually found was that the signaling pathways, the major signaling pathways that would actually recruit the immune system and lead to a robust immune response was actually deficient in those who were insulin resistant. They had normal blood sugar levels. So if you're wanting to put yourself into that, uh, that 85% who does, is not likely to need hospital, the best thing you could do is to take care of your metabolic health. And you can do that very easily with a, with a ketogenic diet. That leads to rapid loss of fat, especially your visceral fat. And if you're wondering why I care about visceral fat, well, it only takes one kilogram of visceral fat in a female, an extra kilogram to quadruple her risk of diabetes. And we know that that's the fat that gets lost first when you start a ketogenic diet. And then some people might say, well, my cholesterol might go up. Well, you know what? LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol and total cholesterol all appear to be protective against infections. The prospective data is that if your cholesterol level is high, you're much less likely to die from having an infection. And that can be quite significant. So there was one study that looked at the risk of developing sepsis, which is life-threatening infection following pneumonia. And they found that people who had LDL cholesterol level of less than 70 milligrams a deciliter were 5.3 times more likely to end up in sepsis than people with higher levels of LDL cholesterol. And in terms of all-cause mortality, all all the data shows the same thing. So one systematic review and meta-analysis that looked at prospective studies looked at 19 studies and 16 of them found an inverse correlation between LDL cholesterol and all-cause mortality. That is, the higher your cholesterol level, the lower your chance of dying. So it really doesn't matter whatever way you slice it or dice it. Being on a ketogenic diet and improving your metabolic health is going to be putting you in a much better state. Absolutely. And for people who are concerned because either they've let things slide or they haven't thought about starting a ketogenic or low-carb diet, they can actually improve things pretty quickly, right? This is not something that's going to take six months of hard work to have a significant impact on their health. You can quite literally improve your blood sugar levels overnight. Mm. So, I mean, if you're a diabetic with, you know, excess glucose in your bloodstream, where do you think that glucose came from? Mm. You know what? Most of it, if not the vast majority of it, came from your diet, what you ate. And what foods contain glucose? Well, carbohydrates are quite literally made of glucose, chains of glucose molecules joined together. So if you stop putting them in your body, you know what? The levels in the blood drop. And we see this. We see levels literally drop overnight. And usually within two weeks, um, we see a lot of people, it it takes about two weeks for the, the fasting blood sugar levels in the morning to become near normal. So that's not a huge period of time. And we're thinking that this pandemic is going to be with us for months and months. So if you understand that in the space of two weeks, you can actually significantly improve your metabolic health and the functioning of your immune system, you'd be mad not to. Yes, exactly. I mean, it it does seem like that. You have have all the things that get wrapped up in why it gets difficult for people to make those changes. But the stark reality of it is that it does make a huge difference and you can turn it about really quite quickly. I read a lot about, and I see mentioned in videos a lot, cytokine storms which sounds very dramatic (laughs) tell me a bit more about that because i know that is one of the things that is important when it comes to talking about metabolic health well cytokines are basically little proteins that communicate between cell to cell and they actually uh, they're involved in the inflammatory response and some of them are more deleterious than others we have one for instance called interleukin-6 which is uh, associated with C-reactive protein, which I mentioned earlier as being a prototypical inflammatory marker. Um, And that's also associated with fat tissue. The interesting thing is this nature study where they looked at um, what happened to the people when they got a respiratory tract infection, if they were insulin resistant, then they had a prolonged release of these 
cytokines at quite an excessive level. And so you think about it, you get a cold and normally, you know, on average 10 or 11 days is the duration it takes for most people to resolve from a cold. Well, even at the, the period of time three to five weeks after these people got these infections, they still had significant elevations in their cytokines. And why is that relevant? Well, one of the mechanisms by which people with coronavirus seem to die is through a cytokine storm, which is basically a state of uncontrolled inflammation that's associated with this condition called acute respiratory distress syndrome. So I would actually be very concerned about insulin resistance, having seen the data that infections in insulin resistant people are associated with prolonged and excessive level of these cytokines and knowing that this cytokine storm um, leads to such bad outcomes in coronavirus, I would not be comfortable if I knew I was insulin resistant and nor would I sit there and ignore it if I knew that there was something that I could do effectively to help manage that. Mm. Oh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. What have you found in your practice obviously this is something you encourage your patients to change about their habits their lifestyle but presumably you come up against some obstacles and some challenges with that what are the things that people find hardest about to make those changes or have you got perfect stellar patients who all manage to fall into place straight away well what I explain to my patients I say I know how to fix this. I I can tell you what to do. And if this was the 1930s when everybody had blind, misplaced faith in doctors, then it would probably work. But the problem is that people have been indoctrinated so much. And fat phobia is usually the big one. Because for a low-carbohydrate diet to work, you have to be able to comfortably ingest fat because you take out carbs as a source of energy, a macronutrient, that only leads to other macronutrients, your protein and your fat. And unless you're comfortable having higher amounts of both those, it's not going to work. And this indoctrination that people have had drummed into them, that the evils of saturated fat, it's like a, it's almost like somebody's leaving a religion. You know, they've always got this little, there's this voice and there's always a sense of disquiet. It's very much on the, on the level of religious belief for some people because that's how passionately they feel about it. And until you can address that belief, you're not going to succeed, the patient's not going to succeed. So it's all about the education and all about the science. So the reason I do so many lectures online, it's not necessary for me in terms of telling the patient what to do. I can tell the patient what to do exactly in five minutes. I can write down explicit instructions. If they follow that, that will work. The trouble is I have to change their belief. I have to change their mindset. I have to get the buy-in. There's no reason for a patient to trust my word over the word of any other doctor. We've both got medical degrees. I'm no more qualified than most other doctors. I mean, a lot of doctors now have PhDs and these kind of you know, master's degrees and things like this. So the only way that I can ask a patient to follow my advice is if I show them the evidence myself and they understand the evidence. And that's the purpose of all of my lectures. It's to try and educate people and have them take control of their own health. And actually, uh, this sounds a a little bit uh, crass, but really to stop trusting the medical profession. Mm. And I think that's one of the things I really like about this community, that in general, people do get really interested in the why. Why is this working? And they gain confidence and they get emboldened by learning some of the science behind it because it all starts to make sense and they can understand why. And I think maybe that helps give them the confidence of dealing with perhaps their doctor is very suspicious of it, but it it gives them the confidence to say, well, hey, look, you know, this is working and this is how I understand why it's working. And you can quite often get them much more on side by doing that. I know my GP certainly is, it's not something he's interested in himself or would probably recommend to any of his clients, but he's seen the impact on my health. And so he finds it very interesting. Yeah, that's the thing. I I think as doctors, we, we underestimate the capacity of the general public to 
actually understand these topics and often understand it in more detail than we do. There's nothing quite like personal interest in a topic to make one want to go and research it in depth. Mm. And I find a lot of my patients are incredibly well educated. And I actually learn off my patients. I mean, my patients come to me for advice and my, my specialty opinion, but perhaps what some of them don't realise is that their, their questions, especially their questions I can't answer, mm. is actually what I learn from. Yeah. Because they're the things that I then go and research. And uh, patients will often ask me about, what do you think about this supplement? And I'll say, I haven't actually heard of that supplement. <laughs> what can you tell me about it? I'll go and have a look. I'll go and look it up. And I, I actually really value the knowledge of my patients. Yes. I can remember reading an article about how some doctors were complaining about Google. And I can understand why the people, you know, Google their illness and come up with all sorts of things and go with a list. Well, I Googled it and it turns out I've got such and such. And the doctor is, well, no, don't be silly. Of course you haven't. But it's this balance, I think, that somewhere in between that, like you were just saying, it's great if they if they're developing an interest in their own health and developing the knowledge about it, it, yeah. it can help you as well. I think that's something we should encourage. And I mean, certainly there, there is a balance, but we don't have to be egotistical about it no. as doctors and say, you know, I've got the degree, you just nick off and I'll tell you what's wrong with it when it's, you know, and I'll let you talk when it's your turn to open your mouth. And there, there still is an element of that in the medical world, unfortunately. If a patient comes in and let's say they say, I, I have this particular condition, as a doctor, I don't want to know what their idea of what the condition is first because I want to go into it without blinkers on. Mm. And I know that if I already have a diagnosis in my head, that's what I'm going to be thinking about and I'm more likely to diagnose that irrespective of whether, you know, what that is actually going to be. And what I really care about is patient symptoms. And it's usually after all that information, then I'll, I'll often say, so what do you think it is? And so if somebody says, oh, I've got this, and some patients will come in saying I have this particular condition and they'll actually want you to accept their diagnosis and uh, just offer the treatment. And for my money, I'll say, well, why do you think it is that? Tell me what specific symptoms you have. And so I don't want you to tell me what the diagnosis is. Point to where the pain is. Describe the pain. Tell me when you get it. Tell me, you know, what it's associated with and, you know, do you have any of these other features and, you know, that allows me to then formulate a diagnosis. But I think to dismiss a patient out of hand who comes in, um, I have actually had patients frequently come in with obscure conditions which they have actually diagnosed themselves. And it's a testament, well, it's actually an indictment on the medical profession that quite often when I diagnose a patient with an obscure condition, they'll say, I knew I had that. <laughs> and what they'll just, they've just learned from negative experience with their other doctors, yeah. even when the other doctors haven't been able to figure it out, they've been dismissive of the patient when the patient's brought that up. So the patients have actually, I guess, quite learnt not to bring it up. And I think that's a sad indictment. We, we really do have to find the balance, but it's incredibly disrespectful to patients to dismiss them when all the patient wants is to be helped. And all a doctor should want to do is to try and help the patient. So we're all on the same team. Yes, that's right. You know? So, I, you know, it's, uh, it, it's quite baffling to me. And I've seen, you know, often you'll see doctors with mugs that saying, don't confuse your Google search with my medical degree. And they have these proudly in their offices. And I, if I was a patient, I really wouldn't want to see a doctor like that. Mm. No, that's right. You mentioned, I'm going to let you go in a minute because we could just keep going down rabbit holes forever. It's fascinating. <laughs> I'm learning so much. But you spoke just now about you need to embrace the fat if you're going to be doing a ketogenic, low-carb diet. It's important to eat the fat. Now, some people will be tempted and actually there are places that will suggest, especially if you've got a lot of weight to lose, that you need to be cutting the fat as well. So it effectively needs to be a low carb and a low fat diet. And for my mind, I know there's a balance. I know you shouldn't be overeating fat, but it's important 
to have a good level of fat, isn't it? You know, why is that? Why do we need to be embracing the the fat side of it? Well, you need to be comfortable with the notion of eating fat, but also, as I, I said, you also need to be comfortable with the notion of eating protein. If you askew fat, that is going to cause issues. Having said that, the ketogenic community has made a mistake of promoting fat too much, I believe, in previous years, so fat bomb coffees Mm. and things like that and litres of cream and adding butter to this and when we could very well just be, uh, you know, eating a piece of steak cooked cooked in tallow, cooked in dripping, it's still got the fat around the edge, that's enough fat. You don't need to be pouring something on top of that. Um, It just introduces unnecessary calories. And in actual fact, protein is more essential, I believe, for the functioning of the body than is fat because all our lean tissues, they're actually made of protein. We can reverse osteoporosis if we have appropriate nutrition with a high-protein diet. So it's been shown to improve organ function, so on and so forth. And from my clinical experience, there is nothing more effective than what could either be called a proteins bearing fast which just means you're eating only protein and effectively um, not having any of the the fat or the carbohydrate or a carnivore diet which is uh, not far removed from a proteins bearing fast which is basically you know lots of animal products which are very heavy on the protein and have lesser amounts of fat so i i think that's uh, i certainly don't encourage people to add extra fat any extra fat you add to your diet is actually removing the need for your body to burn any stored fat as energy so i certainly don't want people to go overboard with the fat but nor do i want them to be cutting the fat off their meat nor do i want them to be grilling their food when they could be frying it in a nice dripping you know i don't want them to be taking the skin off the chicken that they're eating i don't want them to be buying low fat dairy The way I look at it is the way food has been packaged by nature is pretty much spot on. So if you're eating the chicken with the skin on, if you're leaving the fat on the lamb chops, if you're eating the yolk as well as the white with the egg, then you're getting a good balance between protein and fat. So I use the term naked protein. Don't ever eat naked protein. Don't eat protein that's had the fat stripped away. But aside from that, I think if you're consuming food like that, then I think you'll be getting a pretty good mix of fat and protein. Yes, that's the only thing I have seen with people who've tried things like the protein sparing, moderating fast. They tend to see, and especially women, they're the most of the people I speak to. But if the fat goes down too low, it's their mood especially that gets impacted and maybe certain hormonal things. But they... They just feel absolutely rubbish if they don't have enough fat. So I think you're right in the keeping all the fat associated with these things. I know it might work really well for some people, but I've seen in general, the thing that seems to get impacted is mood if you drop the fat down too low. Well, we know this. So we know from the, uh, you know, the Arctic explorers, they used to suffer something uh, when all the rabbits were too lean at the end of the winter mm. in the springtime and it used to, you know, it's commonly cited that that shows what happens if you consume too much protein. It shows nothing of the sort. It shows what happens if you don't consume enough fat. So what people will often do is they'll say, I know that fat is bad and you're now telling me that carbohydrates are bad. So they shoehorn themselves into only having very, very lean protein. And as you've correctly pointed out, fat is an essential nutrient. Protein is an essential nutrient carbohydrates are not exactly (laughs) there is no essential need the minimal amount of carbohydrate that you need to maintain good health is zero i will say that quite clearly this whole myth that you need to have 130 grams of carbohydrate a day to support neurological functioning is based on junk science we absolutely do not need that in a state of ketosis the ketones you're producing will quite adequately power the nervous system and probably power it better than uh, glucose and carbohydrates will so uh, the rule is you don't need carbs but you definitely need both protein and fat so don't eschew the fat no 
Definitely not. I've always naturally liked fatty meat, actually, always, as, as long as I can remember. Obviously, went through a number of years thinking, well, I suppose not, not actually cutting it off. I still ate it, but just felt guilty about it. <laughs> so it's nice to be able to embrace it all again and also enjoy my hatred of fruit. <laughs> so I've always felt guilty about that, too. So the keto diet really is perfect for me. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Fruit's not necessary. No, definitely not. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's been a really, really interesting discussion. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. You've given us all sorts of tips, but perhaps you could round off with a top tip. Well, I mean, the top tip is just eat real food. If it's processed, it's going to have carbohydrate in it. It's going to have seed and vegetable oils in it avoid those two ingredients and you'll be on your way to significantly better health yeah that's really not that hard is it <laughs> well thank you very very much paul it's been a very great pleasure no it's been, the pleasure has been all mine and if anybody's interested i do get onto twitter once in a while and i poke the bears there so <laughs> I, I try not to be too controversial but Every so often I just see something that gets my, my goat enough for me to uh, engage in a bit of uh, a Twitter verbiage. <laughs> we'll put your links in the show notes. And also, of course, you have your YouTube channel with all the videos you mentioned earlier that people can go and, and watch all of those. Yes, yes. So I have most of those on YouTube. I do, I'm trying to collate them all from uh, the corners of the internet at the moment. But um, there is a... Um, there's a bit of a collection there now and I, I think I'm known as somebody who tends to geek out a little bit so <laughs> far as the science of it goes. So it probably appeals to a certain type of person but uh, luckily there appears to be a few of those out there. Perfect. Well, like I say, we'll link to all the things in the show notes so people can find you very easily. Thank you once again. No problems at all. Thank you so much. To get the resources and links from this show, please go to ketowomanpodcast.com forward slash episodes. Please share this podcast with as many people as possible by sharing one of my links or just taking a screenshot of an episode that you enjoyed. Reviews really help raise the profile of the podcast, which gets it in front of more people, but also helps me attract a wide variety of guests. So please take a minute to leave a review on whichever podcast app or platform you like to listen on. It doesn't go unnoticed by me, the people who regularly like, share and comment on my posts. Your support really does mean the world to me. Thank you. Are you enjoying this podcast? Help me make more episodes and videos by making a pledge at my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash ketowoman or simply hit the support button on the Keto Woman Podcast website. Don't forget to join in the fun on the Keto Woman Podcast Instagram and Facebook pages and Daisy underscore Keto Woman on Twitter. Are you my next extraordinary woman? Maybe you've got an idea for a show, a topic you would like to hear about. Let me know how I can tickle your earbuds by dropping me a line at daisy at ketowomanpodcast.com. This week's end quote is from Haruki Marukami. No matter how mundane some action might appear, keep at it long enough and it becomes a contemplative, even meditative act. Bye bye, Keto lovelies. Bye.